Keys. Okay. Uh, last week, we were talking about Jonathan kind of taking the battle to the enemy while Saul and the rest of his cohort was sitting under a tree. And we looked at four different things that happened during the course of that battle as far as others that got involved because of Jonathan's move. Uh, he got his armor bearer involved was the first thing. And then the deserters that had gone over to the side of the Philistines, they got re-involved on the right side of the battle. Then there were some who were hiding in caves trying to stay away from the battle. They came back in and began to fight for Israel again. Uh, and look at the, the very last verse of that section in verse 23. So on that day, the Lord saved Israel and the battle, the battle moved on beyond Beth-Avon. So it's all good news, right? Jonathan and his armor bearer uh, go into battle. Everybody comes out to support them. They win a tremendous victory. The problem comes in when all of the folks who were sitting under the tree get involved and decide that they're going to start making rules for those who were leading the charge. So I want us to start uh, reading in 1424 and see some kind of off-the-cuff decisions that Saul makes. The Israelites were in distress that day because Saul had bound the people under an oath saying, Cursed be anyone who eats food before evening comes, before I have avenged myself on my enemies. So none of the troops tasted food. So you've got an entire army who have taken a vow not to eat anything until they have finished with this battle. And do you notice Saul's verbiage? Until I have gotten my avenging on my enemies. Right? There's no mention of Israel's enemies, no mention of God's enemies. This is all about Saul. And Saul says, I'm going to get my revenge on these people, and so you guys don't stop to eat until you have finished uh, in the battle. Now, there was a place in the forest where they were fighting where some bees had uh, made a hive in the tree, and so there was honey to be had. And the men, when they saw it, refused to eat it and just kept going. The problem was when Jonathan and his armor bearer happened upon the same thing, they didn't know the rules. Why didn't they know the rules? They were too busy leading the assault. See, Saul is in the back of this deal getting messages on what's going on out there. He's not in the middle of the fight. He's making rules from back here about what the men should do who are going into the fight. And so when Jonathan comes by, he and his armor bearer, he eats some of the honey and it gives him strength and he continues on with the battle and he's able to do a better job of fighting than the men were able to do because... The men were forbidden to eat it. When they brought it to his attention, Jonathan says, my dad made a mistake. It was wrong. You should have been able to eat. You would have been more able to take the battle to the enemy if he had allowed you to go ahead and eat. Well, let's go down to verse 31. That day after the Israelites had struck down the Philistines from Michmash to Aijalon, uh, they were exhausted and they pounced on the plunder, taking sheep and cattle and calves. They butchered them on the ground and ate them together with the blood. So someone said to Saul, Look, the men are sinning against the Lord by eating meat that has blood in it. You have broken faith, he said. Roll a large stone over here at once. Then he said, Go out among the men and tell them, Each of you bring me your cattle and your sheep and slaughter them here and eat them. Do not sin against the Lord by eating meat with blood still in it. So if, if you're familiar with the old law, that was one of the main tenets as far as their food regulations were concerned, that they were not to eat blood. And the reason was that the blood belongs to God. All of the animals were given blood by God. All of that belongs to him. So when it came to humans, that's why the death penalty was in place among the Israelites. If you shed blood, then by men shall your blood be shed. So you, the blood belongs to God. Leave the blood alone. When you get to the New Testament and there's that question about whether the Gentiles needed to become Jews in order 
to be saved? The answer is no, but they give them some regulations about how the Gentiles should live. One of the first regulations that they give the Gentiles is don't eat meat with blood in it. So uh, the first one of the first rules the Israelites got, one of the first rules that the Gentiles got, don't eat meat with the blood still in it. So Saul intervenes, and this is a pretty good intervention, but it would not have happened if Saul had not told them that they had to fast while they were fighting. So the men are absolutely famished. Uh, they just start killing and eating whatever they could as quickly as they could. Saul slows them down and makes them do it in a more orderly fashion. Now notice in verse uh, 35, Saul built an altar to the Lord. This was the first time he had done this. So just let that go to the back of your mind. If he'll build an altar to the Lord, will he make sacrifices without Samuel? Yes. Now he's building an altar without Samuel. It's just going to continue with him taking more and more liberties with the religious life of the Israelites. And we'll see more of that in just a minute. Saul said, let's go down and pursue the Philistines by night and plunder them until dawn. Let us not leave one of them alive. Do whatever seems best to you, they replied. So they're famished and they're exhausted. And Saul says, well, let's keep going. You know, I'm feeling fine. I've been sitting under the tree and uh, I'm doing just great. So I'll have a little steak for dinner and then you guys can go back out and fight some more. So he's not thinking very clearly about his troops. But the priest said, let us inquire of God here. So Saul asked God, shall I go down and pursue the Philistines? Will you give them into Israel's hand? But God did not answer him that day. I want us to take a, a, a quick aside here. Usually when it says that they inquired of God and there's a priest nearby, we're talking about the Urim and the Tumim. It's the Urim and the Thummim, we say in Alabama. There, it was two stones that the high priest carried around with him. We'll talk a little bit bit about that more in a minute but at this point he asked God a question and God refuses to answer his question there's no reply at all from God so they decide that something is wrong and Saul says all of you who are leaders of the army let's find out what sin has been committed today his assumption is that God is not talking to him because somebody in the ranks has committed a sin as surely as the Lord who rescues Israel lives, even if the guilt lies with my own son Jonathan, he must die. But none of them said a word. Lots of these guys knew what Jonathan had done. Lots of these guys knew he had broken uh, Saul's rule, but nobody says a word. Keep that in mind. Saul then said to all the Israelites, You stand over there. I and Jonathan, my son, will stand over here. And the answer comes back again. Do what seems best to you. Saul prayed to the Lord, the God of Israel. Why have you not answered your servant today? If the fault is in me or my son Jonathan, respond with Urim. But if the men of Israel are at fault, respond with Thummim. Jonathan and Saul were taken by Lot, and the men were cleared. Saul said, cast the lot between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. Then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me, what you have done. Now, let's take just another minute to talk about this whole idea of the Urim and the Thummim or the Umim and the Tumim. Uh, there is very little information given other than the fact that they existed. When the high priest put on his ephod, the big apron, on this apron was a patch in front that had 12 precious stones. And the 12 precious stones represented each of the 12 tribes of Israel. Somewhere in that vicinity, either inside behind those stones or in a pocket next to those stones, were what they called the Urim and Thummim. And past that, we really don't know much about them. Uh, it's conjectured that they may have been two stones, perhaps one black and one white, or perhaps uh, two stones that had a black side and a white side, each one. And they were used to cast lots. So if the question was, what shall we do? Then, you know, if it comes up Urim, if that's the, the white side, then they cast the lots. And if they showed up 
Whiteside than it would have been the Israelites. If it's Jonathan and I, well, they let it come up thumbing. Well, that may be the black side come up, both of them. And that's the way they ask God questions. There's a couple of problems here. Uh, number one, the high priest over Israel is the only one who's supposed to have these things, which means that Eli's grandson is now serving as high priest. Right? He's the one that Saul has hired to be with him in the camp. He's the one that made the suggestion, maybe we better check with God before we do an all-night uh, attack against the enemy. God won't answer him. So Saul keeps this priest with him and says, I'm going to ask some specific questions, and I want you to intervene with the Urim and Thummim. And when he does, then he gets an answer from God using the Urim and Thummim. Uh, I'll give you some of the other more interesting, wilder versions of what these things were. Some people thought there were a bunch of them, so that maybe uh, you would have, you know, say a dozen uh, of these rocks, and you would throw them, and you know, the the uh, highest number wins, or almost like throwing dice. Uh, one, the, probably the best outrageous one, was that somehow the twelve precious stones made some kind of a projecting device. And that when they ask God and use the Urim and Thummim, that God would activate the Urim and Thummim and give them a message through, this, through these 12 stones. Uh, there's not any Bible to back up any projector uh, in the Old Testament. I don't think they ever had to get out the overhead to get an answer from God. But when there's the less information you have scripturally, the more people can make up trying to figure out what it was. And so people will say all kinds of things. But... Most scholars that I've read think that it was probably two stones of some kind that were used to cast lots or to make a decision to get God's answer. They go away fairly soon after this. You don't run into them as often later on in the Old Testament. And the reason probably is that during Samuel's lifetime, you start seeing the rise of prophets and prophecy. So once you've got prophets who are getting messages directly from God to tell to people, you don't need the Urim and Thummim anymore. You wouldn't have to cast lots if, say, Elijah shows up and you say, Elijah, what does God want me to know about this? And Elijah just tell you. So it, as the further you get into the Old Testament, the less likely you are to see uh, these things show up. Now, when Saul says, if it's the Thummim, then it's me and mine, he knows, at least in his own mind, that it wasn't him. But he has them do it again. Now cast them to find out whether it's me or Jonathan. And when it comes up Jonathan, he says, tell me what you've done. Jonathan knows at this point what's going on. He's been informed by his fellow soldiers what daddy's edict was. And he knows that he's broken that, so he just fesses up. Jonathan told him, I tasted a little honey with the end of my staff. So now I must die. Well, now this would be a wonderful place for Saul, who is the king, to say to his son in the field who just won a tremendous battle, son, let's work something out. Guys, is that okay with you? Let's, let's don't enforce the death penalty on my son. Let's, let's come up with a better answer than that. No, here's what Saul says. May God deal with me be it ever so severely, if you do not die. So he takes a curse on himself to make sure that his son is going to die as a result of eating some honey while he was leading the attack on his daddy's enemies so he could avenge his daddy on his enemies. Isn't that amazing? The more I learn about Saul, the less I like Saul. Uh, I, I don't think I'd have wanted to have lunch with the guy. He was... Good at some things, and we'll notice here in just a minute that, that he did a couple of things really well. But he was so many things that I don't like. He, he was just so into himself, and the farther that he got in as a ruler, the more drastic that became. So Jonathan said, I tasted a little honey with the end of my staff, and now I must die. And Saul said, May God deal with me, be it ever so severely, if you do not die, Jonathan. But the men said to Saul, Should Jonathan die, he who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel? Never. So all of a sudden, the army 
is willing to stand up against the king on behalf of the prince. Now this could get ugly in a hurry too. What's Saul going to do when he's faced with this level of insubordination? As sure as the Lord lives, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground. For he did this today with God's help. So the men rescued Jonathan and he was not put to death. So Saul is backed down from a kingly edict, from a position that he has taken and an oath that he has taken against his own life, saying, you know, God do so to me and even worse if you don't get killed. Well, who was going to kill him? Was Saul going to do the killing or was he going to get one of his soldiers to run him through? Had he thought far enough in advance to think how bloody his hands might get with this whole thing that he's decided? I don't think so. But the men are not, a, not about to allow Jonathan to die after he has won such a great battle. It's ridiculous to them. And they back the king down from his position. And Jonathan does not die. Which is wonderful because the more I get to know about Jonathan, the more I like the guy. I'd like to have lunch with Jonathan as long as his daddy didn't come. I would love to sit down and enjoy some time with Jonathan. Very uh, faithful very loving, compassionate kind of guy. He was everything that his daddy was not, including he was probably a better soldier uh, when all was said and done. But that brings us to 46. What was Saul good at? Saul stopped pursuing the Philistines, and they went back to their own land. After Saul had assumed rule over Israel, he fought against their enemies on every side. Moab, the Ammonites, Edom, the kings of Zobah, and the Philistines. Wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment on them. He fought valiantly and defeated the Amalekites. He delivered Israel from the hands of all those who had plundered them. So he's a pretty decent leader in their warfare. He wins a lot of battles. In doing so, unfortunately, he gets, again, kind of more and more uh, egotistical about his role as king and absolute leader. But he is at least good at defeating the enemies. So when David takes over for Saul, there are still some enemies to be fought against, but Saul passes a better power, a more powerful kingdom to David. David passes a completely powerful kingdom to Solomon. So in two generations of kings, they really go from being the underdog in a lot of battles to being the ones who are the biggest and the baddest in the land of Canaan. So Saul does that pretty well. But unfortunately for him, it makes him feel like he has the right to make some decisions that he doesn't have the right to make. Um, we won't look at his uh, little short genealogy there. Uh, toward the end of uh, 14, but Lord willing, we'll pick up 15 next week. And if you look at the, the lead in to 15, uh, the NIV anyway has the heading, The Lord Rejects Saul as King. So Saul's ego is going to keep driving him in the wrong direction until God finally says, You can't be king and your dynasty's not going to continue and you know, I'm done with you. So that's coming uh, pretty soon. The interesting thing about that, though, is that Saul will still be king for a lot of years after God takes away his blessing from Saul. But we'll see more about that next week. Any questions or thoughts? David is a very young man um, uh, living in the hill country of near Bethlehem watching sheep. <laughs> and he hasn't been clued in yet as to what his life's about to to turn into. Anything else? All right. If there's anything we can do to encourage, we'd love to as we stand and sing.